culture. Yes, okay. We're about to start again. Okay. Oh, and once again, our number of people registered is less than the number of people. More Good morning. Um, welcome back to the second day of the Dense Match in the City. Um, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, we uh, uh, have a very interactive style in our lectures. They are normally 50 minutes of lecture and 30 minutes of discussion. Uh, so try to get our time up to 30 minutes. Those 30 minutes of discussion very important. Anyway, uh, we're very happy to have Eugene here for the second of his two talks. And today he's going to switch gears a little bit and going to talk about universality of optical responses in photo excited systems. And so, yeah, welcome, let's welcome. Okay, uh, is it okay if again I stay here and use the pointer on the screen so that it's visible? Okay, so uh, welcome again. Thank you for. Uh, sort of having the patience to come for the second time. Indeed, I'll uh, tell you about the second uh, direction that we have been exploring. And this is now uh, sort of switching to traditional uh, condensed matter uh, physics. And uh, uh, the work that I am presenting today is uh, kind of a summary of some ideas uh, that really started uh, when Daniel Podolsky uh, uh, who was my graduate student a number of years ago, I uh, came for sabbatical uh, at Harvard. We had a great uh, year. And uh, then I'll try to convince you that uh, there are some kind of universal themes which uh, emerged, uh, which one can understand uh, from a variety of recent experiments. And uh, so uh, the main credit for uh, the uh, work that I'll be presenting today goes to uh, Marios Michael and Pavel Dolgorov. Uh, so Marios was a student in my group. Uh, Pavel is uh, currently a student. Uh, also, uh, more uh, recent work has been done uh, with uh, John Curtis uh, and also some of the related projects with Yuta Ashida. And uh, what also makes uh, these projects a lot of fun is collaboration with our experimental colleagues uh, in the Max Planck Institute. Uh, so this is Andrea Colieri's group and also with Rick Averitt's group at UCSD. So uh, maybe I will uh, start uh, just by uh, saying a few words to younger members uh, of the group uh, that when we talk about optical response, uh, obviously we should specify which spectral range we're interested in uh, and uh, uh, maybe uh, people, uh, so if it's not uh, something that uh, may not be uh, often mentioned in the traditional kind of physics uh, uh, curriculum, uh, that there is a kind of very, interesting uh, range of frequencies and times uh, which uh, is technologically extremely difficult and this is terahertz so why it is interesting because if we think about many body physics uh, 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 like typical collective excitation such as quasi particle gaps uh, plasmons phonons uh, spin resonances they are in uh, this terahertz uh, range and this usually defined between like 0.1 and 30 terahertz uh, on the other hand, this is also the range uh, which is for which we have a scarcity uh, of uh, technologies. So, uh, like powerful sources are hard to come by. Detectors uh, uh, also uh, sort of have their limitations. Uh, however, in the last few years, uh, have been a lot of developments uh, in this, and so a lot of work that I will be presenting today is really. Uh, sort of has become possible due to development of this terahertz technology. And that's why I think it's, and it's a field which uh, sort of will develop quite rapidly in the uh, 
in the future just because technology has become available uh, which we did not have access to before okay and uh, the general uh, kind of emphasis of uh, my talk will be on pump and probe experiments and i want to appeal to your everyday experience uh, that if you want to study a person uh, then what uh, uh, it usually often takes us to put them in a stressful situation. Uh, and so that is kind of an, uh, sort of an attitude which was taken in uh, solid state physics lately when in, uh, sort of people shifted from traditional linear response uh, approach for studying mini body physics to uh, something uh, which is much more non perturbative, uh, let's say the uh, often shine uh, light. Uh, which is tuned into some kind of uh, frequency range at which we, we know that material will absorb it quite efficiently, which again can be terahertz to excite phonons, uh, plasmons or other excitations. It can be optical, but so that it matches some uh, electronic absorptions. And then uh, uh, people measure how, what exactly it does uh, to the system and how properties of the system change uh, following uh, this excitation. And uh, and it's no longer just a way of probing the underlying equilibrium state, but it is also uh, used to try and create a so-called light induced state. Uh, and uh, so what I'll, uh, uh, as you'll see today, is uh, that this uh, idea of light induced uh, state should be taken uh, with a kind of a grain uh, of salt. So the kind of traditional paradigm uh, for light induced states is to think about light uh, changing energy landscape. So for example, it could be that a system has a one global minimum and one metastable minimum. And then uh, when in uh, like following light excitation, the response changes, then interpretation was given is oh the system uh, uh, has been transferred to a metastable state or maybe something even more dramatic that perhaps a state which used to be metastable because of the application of light became uh, a true minimum. But you can see that this whole, uh, uh, method, this whole uh, line of thinking is based on the idea of quasi equilibrium that at any moment in time we can think about the system as being in equilibrium. So, what I will try to argue uh, is uh, that in order to understand uh, many of the current experiments, we need to go beyond this paradigm. So, we should not uh, think about quasi equilibrium state, but really uh, think about uh, systems as a, a sort of as being time dependent, uh, that in many cases we can get uh, insight uh, into uh, emergent properties of the transient state by thinking about a state in which uh, uh, we excited a collective mode, which again, in many cases is a phonon, in many cases uh, uh, it's some other, like many body collective excitations, such as like a Higgs excitation, a superconducting state, uh, or a plasma. And yeah. What's the outfit that Fluctuations and uh, response functions are no longer related by fluctuations. That's good. It's all coming. Yes. 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 We really have to solve dynamics accurately. Yes. Okay. And so, uh, just to uh, give you a uh, sort of summary, so I'll try to argue that this paradigm of materials, which and like I think for many people in this room, a uh, kind of a general uh, perspective on this may come from the idea of flakia materials. So these are materials with time dependent properties. Uh, that this flakia perspective can uh, explain a variety of experiments ranging from superconductors uh, to uh, insulators. Uh, yeah. So why does it help with the strongest? Okay, uh, I'll give you very specific, I do not say it's the strongest. So it depends really how you excite the system. So I'll just wait. It's just something that is very easy to couple to. And in many cases, you do you just take infrared active phonon, you tune your pump probe to be in resonance with this infrared phonon. And then you, what you, when you blast it, you just excite that specific phonon. So, okay, so this is uh, the outline of my talk, actually. Uh, since this is a subject which uh, I'm not kind of not uh, mainstream, uh, at least I think, uh, uh, not for everybody. So I'll start by actually listing experiments which I found interesting, uh, which I found puzzling. And then the goal of my talk will be to try and provide you a universal uh, picture behind them. So uh, that's why it's somewhat unusual. I'll first give you uh, all, can go through list of several experiments and try to uh, point out what is surprising about them. Then I'll give you a, a kind of like a simple theoretical model 
and then uh, show how this general model can be used to explain uh, you know, uh, the main features of those experiments. Okay, so let's start with experiment uh, number one, and this is uh, the so-called photo-induced superconductivity in YBCO. So, okay, before I talk about that, let me uh, uh, sort of uh, remind people uh, some basic facts about collective excitations in layered superconductors, and mostly for younger people who may not be familiar with that. Imagine that we have a layered superconductor, right? And uh, then we want to describe uh, dynamics of the system. So let us define the superconducting uh, phase phi in the first layer, the density, uh, the condensate density in the first layer, the same for the second layer. So we can define the phase difference, uh, the density difference, and difference of chemical potentials. Then uh, one can write fairly simple equations of motion, which basically is just sort of continuity equation uh, for the charge, uh, Josephson equation, uh, Josephson relation for the time derivative uh, of the phase and chemical potential. Uh, and uh, one can show that, the, uh, that there is a simple equation we get for the relative phase, which uh, looks exactly like an equation for the physical pendulum uh, that you know. And this, of course, gives us a characteristic frequency, which is proportional to square root of the Josephson coupling. So this excitation is what's called a Josephson plasma. And if we take uh, uh, like some, uh, uh, like I gave you just two layers. Now let's take a three-dimensional structure, which consists of steps of layer. Uh, then uh, we get uh, uh, like something uh, that is somewhat more complicated. Uh, in particular, say in the case of YBCO, it's a bilayer system. So within one bilayer, uh, we uh, uh, we have stronger uh, Josephson coupling, so we get a plasma at higher frequency. And then between the bilayers, we have weaker coupling, and we get a lower frequency Josephson plasma. Uh, Okay, but so uh, why uh, am I uh, telling you uh, this? Well, let us now talk about optical properties of superconductors. So this is the dispersion of plasmons once we also add finite in-plane momentum, right? So, okay, here you cannot see, but you can, uh, but actually, okay, maybe you can barely resolve that there is a kind of finite energy here, and that's the frequency of the lower plasmon. You can also think about it uh, as a kind of Meissner effect, right, at low frequencies. Uh, uh, light, uh, uh, light cannot penetrate, or you can say electromagnetic radiation acquires a mass, and that's why instead of the usual uh, light collective dispersion, uh, sorry, uh, linear uh, light, we get a finite frequency uh, excitation, uh, which is a plasma. And now if we look at reflectivity uh, from a superconductor, we find that at frequencies below the uh, frequency of the lower plasma, and reflectivity is one, and then it suddenly drops. Right, and the idea is that at smaller frequency, light cannot penetrate. There are no electromagnetic modes inside the superconductor. But once we exceed the frequency of the plasma, we can excite uh, pla uh, those uh, Josephson plasmons, and therefore uh, some light can be transmitted. Okay, so and uh, this you can sort of do it. Uh, just use simple Fresnel formulas uh, using uh, this idea of uh, of plasmons, and I'll show you some of the details later on. But uh, I just want to say that actually this simple theoretical model is pretty much what you see in experiments, right? So we see a lower plasma. Well, actually, the, something similar occurs at a higher frequency plasma in YBCO, uh, but we'll be primarily interested in the lower plasma. Okay, so uh, so far so good. Uh, but then something uh, interesting, uh, maybe it's worth mentioning here, that in YBCO, uh, this Jolison plasma appears only below TC. So for many experiments, uh, like uh, sorry, for the whole community uh, for a number of years, uh, the appearance of just this uh, plasma edge in reflectivity was considered to be the golden standard of superconductivity. Once we see it, while well, you are below to see. Uh, okay, uh, so now here comes a non equilibrium experiment. Then uh, uh, people started exploring pumping the superconductor. So this is just another way uh, of. Uh, uh, of sort of presenting reflectivity, it's color coding. Again, this is a frequency. And the horizontal axis is time after pump. And the pump uh, corresponds to exciting. In this case, it's like around 20 terahertz uh, phonon. I'll say more about it later on. So uh, before the uh, pump pulse arrives, you can see again this plasma edge. Everything gets re reflected at small frequency. And then some light gets transmitted at higher frequency. But after the pump pulse arises, you see that there is an extra edge, right? And uh, 
some people, uh, some interpretations were given, oh, actually with light, we can somehow enhance the Jodelson plasma, and that's why we get a plasma edge at even higher frequency. And then uh, something even more dramatic occurs above TC. So in equilibrium, you can see this dashed line, as we said, that there is no uh, Jodelson plasma edge, right? So, and below TC, well, there is a plasma edge, and that's why plasma was used uh, as, uh, uh, as an identifier for superconductivity. But then after the pump, you can see that a new edge appears, right? Or you can see it like here, it's a, like induced change in reflectivity, there is an edge-like feature. But something quite remarkable, if you try to extract the frequency of the slight induced edge, you can see that it's actually higher than the uh, equilibrium edge uh, at low temperatures. So somehow, if we take this perspective of light induced superconductivity, we're saying we can induce it so that it's stronger than zero temperature uh, equilibrium uh, 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 superconductor. OK, so uh, yeah. Richard. Uh, how long this whole thing lives? Yeah. So in this specific experiment, it's uh, usually it's about picoseconds. So uh, there is uh, most in most of this light induced superconductors, it's about picosecond. But then there is there is one exception. So the, there is an example in K3C60 where it lives nanoseconds, so like thousand times longer. Yeah. Can we discuss it after you, uh, you listen to my story? Okay. Yes. So, so this is about uh, the superconducting dome with optimum doping. It's uh, in this case, it's an underdope material. Oh, okay. So where are low temperatures? You don't have superconductivity at all. No, no, no. It's at low temperature. You do have superconductivity. It's somewhat underdoped. I mean, to see is finite, but like uh, these features. Uh, this sort of the light induced edge. So basically, you can think about is roughly the inside the pseudogap regime. OK, so uh, now, uh, so the second uh, experiment, again, light induced superconductivity. So it's buckyball superconductor. And uh, so uh, it like TC of 20 Kelvin. And if uh, we look at, uh, again, optical signatures of the transition, so uh, here they sort of just de, uh, sort of to more uh, of data analysis. And you can see that uh, in the normal state, real to extract like actual uh, frequency dependent conductivity, so just the usual Fresnel formulas. So you can see that in the normal state, real part of conductivity is finite at zero frequency. Once the system goes superconducting, see that the real uh, part of conductivity vanishes, right? Which is what you expect. There is a quasi particle gap. And then if we uh, look at imaginary part, uh, of conductivity in the superconducting state, you see this one of omega tail, right? And one of omega, again, just to remind you, that's exactly what we would expect for a superconducted, like that's like a London relation, right? The current is accelerated by the electric field. Uh, uh, and so therefore, we, if we convert it to uh, conductivity, we find one over omega, right? Uh, with a factor of imaginary one of omega conductivity. And, uh, now, again, let's see what happens after they excite this system. Uh, they drive uh, phonons. Uh, and uh, in real part, uh, you see that even above TC, there is a gap induced, right, of the conductivity. And in imaginary part, there is uh, one over omega, right, in the response. And this actually shows up even at temperatures which uh, appear to be extremely high, right, like some numerical like factor of four uh, above the equilibrium TC. OK, but then uh, something else uh, happens. If uh, they uh, sort of make a pulse which is stronger and shorter, so again, technological, as we said, theory hertz is a hard technology. So if, uh, let's say, when they are limited in power, they just have, uh, like at least at that stage, if they wanted to have stronger uh, intensity, they had to make shorter pulses. But what uh, has happened is with these short and more intense pulses, uh, reflectivity changed. Notice previously, uh, we talked about, oh, in the superconductor, light gets perfectly reflected, right? It's Meissner effect, and, and that's what you see with longer and weaker pulses. But uh, with uh, the stronger and shorter pulses, you see that reflectivity gets larger than one, right? So like, okay, if you could say reflectivity one, that's Meissner effect, but now 
uh, when light, more light gets reflected from the probe beam, that you cannot attribute this to superconductivity. So, and of course, this doesn't violate energy conservation because this is following a pump. So we made a very non-equilibrium state. So this is going, going back to Pierce's question all about fluctuation dissipation, right? Obviously, no equilibrium system can give you reflectivity greater than one. Okay, uh, another uh, puzzle. So, okay, the third system, this is uh, uh, the TNS. So this material is commonly discussed uh, in the context of, as a uh, kind of candidate for excitonic insulator, that this aspect will not be uh, so important to me. Uh, so let me just focus on uh, uh, sort of optical response pump and probe experiments. And uh, basically what uh, this shows is, uh, Kind of you see it's uh, reflectivity kind of divided by the uh, after the pump divided by reflectivity before the pump right so it's really a change in reflectivity it's a complicated structure because in this case we have many uh, IR active uh, phonon phonons but clearly reflectivity goes up right okay we don't get kind of amplification but we get a change in reflectivity which can be as large as like 25 percent. But there is something fundamentally different in these experiments because early experiment that I showed you, while it was kind of like it's still uh, exciting something on the scale of terahertz, like phone and frequencies, maybe 20 terahertz and looking changes in reflectivity, uh, like at a few terahertz. But in this case, excitation was done with an optical pulse. So here we're talking about a few hundred terahertz. So we're exciting the system completely in a different spectral range where sort of getting very high energy uh, uh, cause a particles into the system, yet we see an appreciable change in reflectivity at terahertz frequencies. Again, sort of uh, sounds very uh, surprising. Okay, and uh, uh, the last experiment that I want to talk about is uh, uh, normalized terahertz uh, emission. So in this case, we are back in uh, in the high TC line, but this is now a striped superconductor, and uh, and. Uh, and they uh, excited, so this is uh, Andrea Quarieri's group experiment, they excited again with an, uh, an uh, optical pulse, right? So you can see like around 400 terahertz. But uh, then after this optical pulse is gone, what they see coming out is a one terahertz light, right? That somehow by exciting at very high frequency, we got a very uh, low frequency back. And as we'll discuss later, something, what is surprising is that this really happens only when we have uh, incommensurate stripes and superconductivity. So that it's actually, it happened, it really requires a very specific combination uh, of uh, factors. Okay, so <coughs> I sort of gave you uh, an overview of experiments that we'll try to think about. Uh, and the idea is, uh, okay, how can we find a unifying explanation? Uh, and uh, secondly, what can we learn about the underlying system uh, from uh, these experiments? So questions so far. Yes, it, you have to have both. You cannot just have in commensurate stripe without superconductivity. You will not get it. I'll show you experimental data. Okay, so let me start. You know, with a level of optics that even condensed matter theories can understand, uh, like myself. So that's our familiar Fresnel uh, equation, uh, right? So we have incident light, and uh, then if we want to see uh, uh, how it gets reflected, we uh, think of incident light well, here, okay, for reasons of some connection to uh, quantum optics, I'll label it with S, uh, like signal. Uh, and then uh, light can be reflected or transmitted. Uh, and we know that uh, inside uh, the material, the wave vector can change. And in order to find the wave vector of transmitted light, we have to use just the usual equation, which gives us wave vector in terms of frequency dependent index of refraction, right? And then we uh, write boundary condition just matching electric uh, and uh, magnetic field. And we get, you know, the canonical Fresnel uh, reflection formula. So now imagine uh, I do something uh, very simple, uh, sort of like semi-phenomenological and say, oh, what if my index of refraction is not constant? Like we, like, uh, we remember from our textbooks, but it's modulated in time, that there is some characteristic frequency it at which uh, the index of refraction is being modulated. And I sort of already gave you an idea that this is because we excite some kind of collective mode. 
So how would we solve Fresnel equation now? Well, one of uh, the properties of uh, such uh, Flakia systems is parametric resonance. So like we can actually generate uh, excitations in such a way that uh, uh, they uh, kind of uh, basically by borrowing energy from the drive. So if uh, our oscillations, let's say, uh, if it's an index of refraction, right, it cannot couple to electric field. It's uh, sort of, it basically it has the symmetry of E squared, right, rather than E. Therefore, it can only generate pairs of photons. And that's why uh, it will, can generate pairs of photons such that their frequencies add up to the drive frequency. And what this means is uh, that if we want to solve uh, the problem of just light propagation inside the medium, we can no longer say that it's monochromatic. We uh, have to assume uh, that it couples uh, to, uh, to a kind of a partner frequency in such which is exact, which satisfies uh, this uh, condition of the parametric resonance. And uh, so therefore, uh, like if we want to now find the wave vector of light that can be propagated, you can think about it as now we have to find sort of like here eigenmole, like here polaritons, right? Like usually polaritons are just sort of uh, more or less what that's what we find by solving uh, for, uh, for K inside the material. These are hybrids of uh, light and matter. And here, these are hybrids of light and matter when matter is being periodically modulated, right? And so it will have new sets of, uh, uh, of momentum. Okay, and so now what we can do is we can just take this, say, okay, well, but if uh, uh, we uh, we know eigenmodes inside the material, uh, then uh, we can actually redo the entire Fresnel calculation and uh, see how this will affect uh, reflectivity. And naively you would say, oh, it's parametric resonance, so we should uh, only get uh, enhancement of light reflection, right? Like it's an it's an amplifying medium. Actually, what happens is uh, that first of all, what's surprising is that you can get a universal formula in a sense that it depends on very few uh, parameters, right? It's sort of, it's, uh, uh, you just have to know, let's say equilibrium index of refraction uh, and reflection coefficient, you, you need to know uh, frequency of parametric resonance. And then there are constants, which in a given microscopic uh, uh, theory you can compute. But uh, the idea is uh, that you know that uh, Kind of the induced reflectivity change is really a combination uh, of uh, just two uh, sort of Lorentzian and double Lorentzian. And uh, if you look with parameters, it actually the way reflectivity changes has much richer structure. So if we drive very strongly and uh, uh, sort of plasmons, uh, sorry, polaritons in the medium are, are under them, well, we get light enhancement when we're sort of on this, uh, in the regime that satisfies parametric uh, resonance condition. But if we're in the regime where drive uh, is weak uh, and dissipation is strong, we can actually uh, we can actually get a suppression. We can get a dip. Again, I'll not go into details, but roughly uh, you can think about it's, uh, uh, some of you remember like Fanoff uh, formula. Imagine that it's, uh, let's say we have a hybridization between something uh, uh, like we're exciting a system that consists of two oscillators. One is a resharpened frequency, the other is broad, but then uh, absorption will be determined by interference of two frequencies and they can interfere destructively or constructively. And when they interfere de destructively on resonance, you can actually get a dip uh, rather than a peak. So here it's kind of signal and adder. It's kind of like this Fano type system where we have two frequencies uh, uh, at which a signal can propagate and they can interfere destructively or constructively. Okay, so, and then there are actually even more subtle features such as uh, for experts in optics, like uh, if, uh, which resemble more like EIT, uh, electromagnetic induced transparency type features, which actually is not surprising. EIT is also some kind of parametric resonance. Okay, but so now how can we uh, use this channel? So this is kind of a general framework. How do we uh, uh, use it to uh, explain experiments? Let's start with YBCO. Uh, yeah. So uh, nonlinearities is hidden in the assumption that the uh, excited pulse uh, sort of started oscillations of index of refraction, right? If it was a linear system, light go through, index of refraction is just constant, nothing happens to it. But you'll see like later on, I'll be specific. So okay, it's very generic index of refraction, but later on we'll talk about which specific 
physical property is being modulated as a result of oscillations. So that's when the flow has a I mean, it's it's kind of a more. Uh, so it depends uh, on the symmetry. Usually, you know, like um, it's more like two four. Uh, like, uh, it depends. Sometimes it's three. Sometimes it's four. But and it's always always like hybrid between phonons and polaritons. I think you'll see. Kind of more specific, like specific examples. So I want, don't want to kind of generalize at this moment. Yeah, but it is kind of nonlinear interaction indeed between kind of phonon type excitation. But this phonon, uh, but in, this can be phonon. This can be Jonathan plasmons. You can see it can be like a Higgs excitation, and or like uh, Goldstone modes, the super like plasmons. So like it's it's a large variety, but they all hybridize with light. That's how we can excite them and detect them. No, so what I assumed, uh, not necessarily, right? So in fact, uh, no, so you see drives the frequency is the frequency of collective mold that we excite, right? But uh, uh, like say an IR active collective mode would not, uh, it can only modulate index of refraction at twice its frequency. So that's why, you know, if I excited a collective mode, it could be that index. So like depending on the symmetry, uh, like in other examples, we can excite directly uh, like a collective mode, like a Higgs, and then it can linearly modulate index of refraction. So that's why, Okay, sometimes it's it's linear in terms of uh, which collective mode you excite. It sometimes it's quadratic. Uh, you'll see different cases. So omega I D. So omega D omega drive. It's a collective mode, but but and sometimes you will see. Okay, yeah. There's just wait. Some sometimes whatever you excite, it is not exactly the frequency at which you drive. So actually, this is coming right now. So in the case of uh, uh, this YBC, also you drive at. Uh, uh, at the frequency which correspond to uh, epical oxygen phonons, infrared. So I, uh, there are two of them uh, roughly separated by around three uh, terahertz. And uh, so what we know is uh, that this drive excites uh, Jodelson plasmas. Uh, and uh, there are two possibilities. One is uh, that uh, when we excite a phonon, then this phonon, it just so it kind of nicely matched uh, that it can generate one upper Jodelson plasma and that is lower Jodelson plasma. Remember, for YBC, we said that there are two of them, like within a bilayer and between the bilayers. Uh, another scenario is that actually there are two phonons, it turns out, as I said, uh, and therefore, like it can be the difference of two phonons, which is driving directly uh, the uh, lower, uh, the lower plasma. So what, uh, so like for what I am discussing now, actually, I will be sort of agnostic which of them, like early experiments uh, based on second harmonic generation suggested that this is the kind of scenario that actually the so signatures of uh, photo excited phonon generating both types uh, of uh, plasma, the upper plasma and the lower plasma, kind of more follow up experiments suggest that maybe uh, uh, it's more like this mechanism where two phonons, uh, it's important to excite two phonons in order to excite the lower uh, Plasma. And what's important to me is that okay, we excite lower plasma, but again, this is the selection rule, right? For what matters uh, for changing optical properties, it cannot be plasma itself because plasma is like an IR active mode, right? It cannot modulate something like index of, ref uh, of refraction. And therefore, the modulation that excited plasmas will do will be at twice the frequency of the plasma, of the photo excited plasma. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, actually, originally the uh, argument, what this, it was uh, kind of made it natural uh, to have the first scenario because then you know the phonon frequency that you excited, then you know that the resonance scattering will have to satisfy no general momentum conservation. But the uh, but. The upper plasma the rising doesn't have any dispersion. Therefore, you know that you'll always excite it at a fixed frequency, right? Therefore, you know at which frequency you will excite the lower plasma, and that immediately tells you what's the momentum 
uh, of that lower plasma. And when they saw some kind of radiation coming out, it was consistent with exactly this finite moment. Second harmonic generation, so it was consistent with seeing exactly that moment. It makes it easier to interpret uh, the data. Okay, uh, good, other questions? Okay, so uh, we got, uh, and that's why uh, we can also uh, say that it's, it's kind of, uh, yes, you can say stability for interpretation that we know that kind of uh, whatever the modulation that we'll have, it will be uh, twice the frequency of phonon frequency minus the upper uh, Jodelson plasma frequency, right? So, and that also helps like, the idea that oh, when you have to drive, you have to use two plasmons by the selection rule that allows like plasmons excited finite Q provide modulation at zero moment. Okay, but uh, how does it help uh, to uh, explain the experiments? Well, now we do exactly uh, uh, sort of apply this analysis, which I gave you before and say, well, now let's assume that uh, we take our kind of picture of a superconductor and uh, say that the index of refraction is modulated at the frequency, right, at twice the frequency of this photo excited Jodelson plasma. Uh, and, and it was also excited, uh, let's say in this case, at finite momentum. Uh, and uh, then what do we expect uh, to see as a change in reflectivity? If uh, Y below TC, we expect Jodelson plasma to be underdamped, we expect to see a sharp feature. And that's exactly how we can explain this additional feature that appeared in reflectivity below TC. Now, if we are above TC, we say, well, let's think about it as a system that uh, has very uh, damped uh, plasmas. They have uh, sort of finite momentum uh, plasmas. We don't have long range shoulders. They are very overdamped, but they exist. And therefore, uh, we can uh, now apply this formula uh, of photo induced changes in reflectivity in the regime where damping dominates and you can, uh, so first of all, yeah, with this model of overdamped plasmons, we can uh, sort of describe uh, equilibrium uh, uh, reflectivity. And we can also see uh, how can also, uh, yeah, which is here, sorry, this is uh, theory. And we can also explain uh, how by exciting, uh, by modulating, uh, uh, by driving plasmons, we can see something that resembles uh, uh, the Josephson plasma edge, but again, in this case, it's so. In fact, if you uh, look at the numbers more carefully, you find that to explain the data, you have to say that Josephson plasma had been somewhat suppressed uh, by the drive. But the reason why we see uh, this higher, uh, let's say, this resonance at higher frequency, the reason why uh, we see uh, this photo induced edge at a higher frequency at equilibrium gap is again because we excited those plasmas like at higher frequency. Uh, uh, and uh, anyway, so uh, questions about this, right? So therefore, uh, kind of this experiment is not a demonstration of photo-induced superconductivity. It it reveals pla uh, sort of plasmons which have finite lifetime, which are overdamped, uh, uh, but it does not really uh, sort of make a true superconductor by exciting uh, photons. Okay, right. Okay, yeah. So here is more detailed uh, comparison uh, of, uh, let's say, changes in uh, reflectivity. So below TC, you see this uh, photo uh, induced edge, right? And uh, this is a photo induced change in reflectivity uh, above TC. Okay. Uh, so this is theory uh, and this is experiment. Okay, now let's do uh, K3 uh, C60. So here, uh, maybe I'll. Uh, Again, for the sake of younger people, I, I'll uh, again remind the idea of the uh, Higgs mode, right? So often when we uh, talk about broken symmetry, right, we draw this Mexican hat and then we say that there are excitations which go along the bottom of this potential. This is uh, the Goldstone mode and then the excitation that change uh, the amplitude of the other parameter. That's called what we call an Anderson Higgs mode. But the Anderson Higgs mode uh, can actually decay uh, into uh, lower, into two uh, uh, Goldstone modes. And that's why, it's like, remember yesterday, I showed you this data on uh, uh, sort of seeing the Higgs excitation in cold atoms, and, but the peak was rather broad. So why was it broad? Well, it's exactly because this Higgs excitation could decay into uh, these uh, uh, Goldstone modes. And uh, so uh, what's... Uh, I will tell you now is a simple 
argument that if we have a superconductor in which uh, we excited, in which we have an excited Higgs mode, then it should have reflectivity uh, greater than one at uh, small frequencies. So, and uh, the question then, okay, like, so, uh, and uh, okay, let me start by explaining why this is fairly generic. So now I will be more microscopic than what uh, we discussed before. So if we uh, excite, uh, sorry, uh, again, taking a step back. So if we look at the relation between of the current uh, and superfluid velocity and superconductors, you remember that it includes the superfluid density. And uh, in a static superconductor, while superfluid density is just a constant. But if we have something oscillating, such as an excited Higgs mode, it's natural to assume that the uh, superfluid density should also oscillate with the frequency of the Higgs mode. And then we can immediately uh, sort of suggest the same argument. Oh, if we have a superfluid density oscillating, it should generate pairs of Goldston modes. And of course, Goldston modes and superconductors talk to light. And therefore, we can imagine a situation in which uh, so we have n photons and frequency omega one come in, uh, but then we uh, the system will generate a pair of these photons. Uh, and it, in fact, like if we already were sending probe photons and the frequency omega one, they will really dominate this photo generation. And therefore what will be reflected is an extra photon at the same frequency of the incident light, plus also the complementary frequency, uh, the one that makes uh, so that the two frequencies add up to the Higgs excitation. In the language of quantum optics, these two frequencies are called signal and idler. That's why I use that uh, SNI, uh, SNI in this. Okay, and in fact, now we can uh, even do things more uh, microscopically. So when we analyze light reflections from a superconductor, right, what we really do, we solve Maxwell equations, like traditional Maxwell equations, and we have to couple them to uh, equations in the medium, right? Let's say current, because uh, Maxwell equations include equations for the medium for current. And in superconductor, right, we, uh, right, uh, that uh, the time derivative right of superfluid uh, uh, velocity right is electric field. That's London equation, and the coefficient in front superfluid density would be constant. But now all uh, we have to do is just say superfluid density is now modulated. So let us sort of solve this simple problem uh, of a superconductor in which superfluid density is periodically oscillating in time, and look at what uh, reflectivity we would get. Well, and that's, uh, so this is a slime. So these, uh, intro, and so we can phenomenologically extract uh, what is the strength of uh, modulation of superfluid density. Well, okay, we also have to add phenological dissipation. So this was really uh, kind of this, uh, 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 kind of uh, the work that done by uh, Daniel when we started thinking uh, about Andrea Cavalieri's experiment that we can nicely explain uh, uh, this enhanced uh, reflectivity just by just by thinking about uh, uh, superconductors with modulated superfluid density. And now it's also clear like why uh, this uh, effect appears only for weak and short pulses because well if we are somehow enhancing superconductivity again like, actually this K360 is exactly this material that leaves in the transient state for a nanosecond. But so for now like I don't actually uh, go into the detail why like indeed we are uh, sort of enhancing superconductivity. But what matters is uh, how, like for our discussion what matters is how quickly we do it. If we do it on time scales, which are longer uh, than the sort of the characteristic time scale, which is the frequency of oscillation, this is kind of thing, the system will kind of gently roll to a new equilibrium. But if we do it faster than the characteristic frequency of the oscillation at the bottom, then we will excite this collective mode, right? And that's exactly the Higgs mode. So therefore, and therefore, indeed, if we look at the numbers that uh, this uh, enhanced reflectivity greater than one, this uh, amplification uh, can only be seen uh, when the uh, pulse, uh, basically the pulse duration is sufficiently short, when we like rapidly uh, create a superconducting state. Any questions here? Uh, so in both okay, cases- Okay, now let's switch to uh, superconductors and uh, this uh, is uh, this uh, tantal nickel uh, selenite. And as I said earlier, the surprise here is that uh, we are pumping uh, at high frequency, at optical frequencies, right? Uh, but if we look at change in reflectivity, it seems to be uh, focused around a few terahertz. Right? And so, uh, in fact, we can just take uh, this kind of simple phenological model uh, that I uh, showed you earlier, 
and ask, okay, what kind of uh, periodic uh, oscillations would give us this enhancement of reflectivity? And you find uh, that uh, this reflective list sort of, uh, we could get a nice phenological fit to this uh, uh, experiments if we assume that there are oscillations around nine and a half terahertz. Okay, but that obviously is way, way lower than the frequency at which we excited the system. So, uh, Okay, so then you uh, go through kind of properties of TNS and you find that while there is a uh, kind of a, a phonon, it's an infrared uh, phonon, uh, which has a frequency of 4.7 terahertz. In principle, you could excite it, but of course you are so far detuned then directly you should not, it's hard to excite, you know, something when you're driving at, you know, a uh, hundred times uh, larger frequency. Uh, okay, and, but also oscillations appear to be not at the frequency of this uh, phonon, uh, but at actually twice the frequency, but twice the frequency is already suggestive because again, as we said, like if a, a, an IR phonon is excited, uh, oscillation in index of refraction can only occur at twice the frequency of that phonon. Therefore, uh, maybe it's not so crazy to say that we excited a squeezing uh, of the phonon, uh, sort of like Q squared uh, rather than Q itself. Okay, now where does this come from? Well, in a nutshell, uh, we can say the frequency of uh, the pump has been tuned to the interband transition, right? So therefore, uh, what we should think about is not really resonantly exciting uh, phonon itself because we're very far off resonant, but asking how does the change in the electronic occupation number affect the phonon? And then you can do a very simple algebra and say, well, okay, it's actually, so this interband transition, uh, uh, has dipole moment like the phonon is directive, so it's natural to expect some kind of linear coupling. And uh, in fact, there is a strong uh, linear coupling. Uh, uh, but now, as we said, what we care about is uh, uh, like uh, not really sort of this transient induced dipolar moments of the interband transition, because that happens at very high frequency, but rather change in uh, occupation number. So what you, you do kind of canonical Schiffer Wolf transformation, and you see uh, that the occupation numbers uh, like of uh, the electron, it couples to Q squared, right? So therefore what the way to really understand what happened to the experiment is once we photo excited electrons into the upper band, effectively for the phonon, it's as if we suddenly change the spring constant, right? So somewhere, and that's what, remember your quantum harmonic oscillator problems, right? What happens if you have a harmonic oscillator in equilibrium, suddenly you change the spring constant. Of course, it's not start moving right or left. It will just start this kind of breathing oscillations at twice the frequency of the phonon. That's exactly excitation uh, of uh, squeezing. And, uh, and uh, so then uh, all you have to do is just check, okay, well, is there actually uh, so a strong coupling between uh, these photo excited electrons and this specific, uh, uh, photo excited electrons because you know what is uh, the band gap which electrons get excited does do they couple to this 4.7 terahertz and this is uh, what uh, Anke Rubio and his group have done and they demonstrated that indeed there is very strong coupling between this specific phonon and that specific uh, interband transition and that's why uh, uh, like uh, somehow you know uh, recovery had a lot insight that uh, uh, or maybe just uh, intuition from coming from experience that it was the right frequency to uh, 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 to use for uh, for the pump because it excites uh, it excites uh, uh, the right phonon. Right. Okay. And this just shows you again comparison of this sort some sort of phenomenological uh, theory, which you say, oh, it's just we just excite uh, this uh, uh, squeezing of uh, uh, this phonon. It oscillates around nine point four terahertz to be more precise, and this is how it would affect. Uh, reflectivity, uh, so they do like this theory, right? And uh, uh, and uh, green, right? Uh, and this yellow are experiments. Of course, it's not perfect, but again, we use a fairly uh, simple uh, model, right? We didn't try to go into the details of matching all the phonons uh, in the system. Yeah. So when you say light. No, so what you had, uh, what happens is if you look at, the, it's a complicated band structure, right? Depending on which frequency you choose, you will excite different interband transitions. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you can ask how these specific electrons couple to specific yeah, phonon. Yeah. So like in some, uh, like here, uh, it was kind of interesting that we uh, 
just based on the logical model, uh, we had a guess that, look, you know, as I said, like to explain the data, we must be exciting this phone. On the other hand, we know that uh, this uh, pump primarily excited electrons across across this specific range in, in, in the Brulean zone. That's why can you guys just check that it, these specific electrons have strong coupling to the phonon? And they checked and they did it. Turns out that they, it's the strongest coupling. It appears that it appears exactly, exactly. So exactly. So this I kind of that's why I'm saying kind of Rick was sort of I don't know if it was insight or luck uh, that yes the uh, incident light was exactly tuned to excite electrons that strongly couple. Uh, there is actually another, like since you mentioned symmetry, something interesting happens that, you know, this TNS has two phases, one low one, which people believe is excitonic insulator. So it turns out that this effect only happens in the slow temperature phase. It doesn't happen in the uh, high temperature phase. And so uh, we thought that there will be some symmetry reason why phonon just does not couple to interband transition. We could not find one. We see that the matrix elements are small in the high temperature phase by something like a factor of 10, but we cannot find like a symmetry reason for it. But, but experimentally it does look like this photo induced change in reflectivity just tracks the other parameter. Good. Okay, so uh, now let's uh, talk about uh, the stereocard radiation from the striped superconductor. Okay, and I already gave you uh, uh, kind of the general idea. So there is no bias field, no magnetic field, photo excited optical frequencies, and then see, uh, and then uh, Andreas group uh, sees uh, kind of low frequency one terahertz radiation uh, that comes out. So let me just briefly show you the results. So here we take a super connector without the stripes, kind of very similar, right? LCO instead of LBCO and uh, different temperatures. And this is kind of a measured terahertz field very tiny signal, right? So essentially none. Then uh, quasi-static stripes, like commensurate stripes. Again, like we can be below superconducting TC, above superconducting TC, essentially no signal. Uh, or uh, here, there are these, again, fluctuating stripes, again, some signal, like an appreciably. But the strongest signal is uh, when they take incommensurate uh, static stripes, you can see like very strong terahertz signal. And you can also see that it clearly sort of shows some very characteristic frequency, right? That we excite something that looks almost coherent. And if you do Fourier transform, well, you see indeed that uh, there is some uh, kind of, as we said, like uh, radiation that comes out is very strongly picked at uh, a certain frequency. And we can ask what is this frequency? And it actually matches uh, the frequency of Josephson plasmas. And as they change temperature, right? So here you can see different temperature, like above the superconducting TC. Actually, there is no signal. As we said, you have to have superconductivity. And uh, then, uh, so the highest frequency uh, is at lowest temperature and the plasma frequency. So uh, you see this gray point, this is equilibrium plasma frequency. And the blue points is uh, the frequency that's extracted uh, from this photo induced uh, uh, sort of terahertz light. And obviously, they track each other. Okay, so uh, since uh, my time is uh, essentially uh, over, I'll just uh, sort of give you a broad's eye kind of general picture how we understand these experiments now. So uh, we have two, two questions. Yes. Uh, the first is from Ilya Ehrman. Yes. Ilya says, I have a question. Sure, okay. Well, I can ask my question at the end, uh, Pierce. Uh, so let uh, Eugene conclude and uh, I can ask. Yeah, I, I can't, we can't hear you. Actually, now you muted yourself. Yeah, we can't hear you. Yes, uh, do you hear me now? Sorry, Ilya. Do you hear me? Oh, yeah, yes. Do you hear me now? Yes. Uh, sorry, I was going to ask at the end, but if I now allow to ask, um, Eugene, you know very well that if you do a microscopic calculator, then uh, the contribution to nonlinear optics is dominated by quasiparticles, which also uh, appear to be a two delta, as you know. And so for me, the question is, uh, how much would change in your, let's say, logic, if you would call what you call Higgs, would you actually call, uh, let's say, um, oscillation of the continuum, which also will be a two delta, as we know. 
So, and then it will also be nicely over damped, as you see in some of the experiments. So to me, it's more um, um, logic. I mean, what you call Higgs uh, is uh, uh, nice, but if you do microscopic calculation, you see that actually, actually the, uh, the light is part of other particles, which also have featured to delta, actually uh, three orders of magnitude higher. Right, so details, whether we call it a Higgs or whether we call it a quasi-particle, uh, it's not so important. So I gave you a simplified picture of oscillations were, ta were taking place at a single frequency. Uh, if uh, this feature is more broad and if this is more like an edge, I mean, clearly like there is this, uh, like in response function will have a peak like at around two delta. We, and uh, uh, so you can do multi-frequency gen generalization of like here and the story does not change much. So yes, uh, uh, I sort of, it's easier to explain when we call it Higgs, but uh, like details of how much of it is a true Higgs, how much of it is, the edge excitation for the quasi-particles doesn't matter. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and yeah, so in both cases, uh, you had the components uh, in reflectivity Igor? and- uh, uh, yeah. Igor, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Oh, excellent. So in both cases, uh, you had two components, uh, uh, both in reflectivity and in superconducting density. Uh, are there any bounds for the second component? Uh, I think you called it uh, lambda one. Clearly it should be less than the constant component, but... Uh, oh. uh, yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Like obviously, like superfluid density cannot go negative. So uh, yeah, 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 as you yeah, can yeah, see, yeah, like yeah, already but... something which is kind of uh, surprising is to explain this K3 C60. We had to assume pretty strong modulation, right? It was like around 50% of the equilibrium superfluid density. But yes, of course, mod the modulate would be like we would have to rethink uh, the philosophy if we find that the modulated component has to become larger than the static one. Yes, but I mean, is, it it could... the only is, is it the only bound that you have or, or oh, it you, should be even less than that? You see, like, uh, I would not talk about bounds because the pictures that we are presenting uh, that I told you is very simplified. Uh, like, for example, I assume that oscillation are happening at one frequency. But as I said, like as Ilya was asking, well, most likely uh, because there is a, like, finite lifetime and therefore either because it's uh this higgs is more like a edge, sort of edge uh peak in the quasi-particle continuum or just other ways of damping of the higgs it's probably like modulation is probably occurs at many frequencies and that's why uh, it's a more complicated formalism to do multi uh multi-tonal like here so i like I can put bounds in this uh, kind of model with oscillation at a single frequency, but that probably doesn't relate uh, to actual experiment. I think we're more in the uh, kind of trying to get a qualitative picture with sort of semi-quantitative comparison at this point. I don't know if I, if I, so that's why I'm sort of, I'm reluctant to try and put like real mathematical bounds. No, I'm just a little bit worried that in order to explain the experiment, you have to assume that the uh, second component is quite large, whether well, it's actually can be that large. But that, I am also worried you. about this, but again, like, so the way I think about probably what's happening uh, is that actually modulations uh, is happening not at just one frequency, it's, it's, these are several frequencies. And that's why this kind of modulation would have to be distributed over a certain spectral range. And we're just doing a kind of Mickey Mouse model of this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Oops, other questions? We are kind of in the discussion. Okay, so uh, let's see. Well, okay, but we already started the discussions, but let me finish this kind of singing superconductor story. So, okay, we are uh, pumping, uh, 
with uh, optical pump, right? It, it says very high frequency quasi particles. And that I will try to convince you that the first thing that happens is that there is a usual uh, kind of nonlinear optical response that you can get, uh, even if you drive the system frequency omega, you can get nonlinear response either at frequency of two omega or at frequency omega minus omega, which is essentially zero. That's terahertz, but that's very, that would be very broad, right? So that can explain how we get sort of down conversion of light from high frequency uh, to low frequency, but it doesn't explain uh, why we actually get something that comes out so coherently. And then the stage two is uh, these uh, shift currents, like what, which arise from quasi particles, they effectively get filtered uh, by Josephson plasmas. And that's why light that comes out is actually uh, uh, sort of so strongly picked uh, at, uh, at the plasma frequency. Okay, so first of all, yeah, like when we talk about uh, nonlinear optics, like uh, uh, obviously, right, what's more familiar is the second harmonic generation that we can absorb to uh, photons and get a response at to omega, right? But as we said, you can also get a response at, you know, omega minus omega. But let me remind you that uh, in all cases, right, for either second harmonic generation or, uh, or uh, the shift currents, certain symmetries have to be broken. If we have inversion symmetry, say we cannot get a second harmonic generation, we cannot uh, have a shift current. So the symmetry consideration will be important later on. Uh, and as I, but as I said, like this, just shift currents alone cannot explain the story because if we look at the incident uh, light, right, it has a width of around uh, sort of uh, uh, 10 terahertz, right? So therefore, if we just down convert it, we would get uh, some kind of, uh, you know, terahertz light, which would be, which would come out like broad, like in a 10 uh, terahertz frequency range, whereas uh, you saw that it came out like fairly sharply picked at one terahertz. Therefore, we have to bring in uh, this uh, idea of filtering, and that's something that should be familiar to you, right, from your basic undergraduate, that imagine you apply a voltage, right, in uh, the LC circuit, and then you compute what's the current that you get. Okay. Uh, basically, we apply the same voltage across all frequencies, but the current that we get will be very strongly picked at the resonance of the LC circuit. Essentially, it's the same physics that uh, happens uh, once we send this terahertz light generated by quasi particles through the filter uh, of Cooper pairs, which in this case is Josephson plasma, so it's like an LC circuit. And then uh, the strongest response that we will get uh, is at the intrinsic frequency uh, of the system. So there is just one uh, subtlety uh, in the story. So when you think about plasma, so far I told you about bulk plasmas, right? And they have uh, a dispersion, uh, an upward uh, dispersion, right? And then you can ask, oh, like which, like so which, uh, what's special about, let's say the bottom of the band. Uh, but uh, if you take layer superconductors, uh, then there is another type of excitation and these are surface plasmas. Uh, and uh, they are uh, actually they dispersion, uh, sort of, uh, it starts at zero frequency, just because again, that's something you remember in 2D superconductors, right? You can have gapless. So surface of a superconductor is like a 2D superconductor. That's why it can start gapless, but then it, the surface plasma is actually saturates to the frequency of the bulk uh, plasma. And then if you uh, just compare uh, the type of radiation that comes out, that it's always peaked slightly below uh, uh, the bulk plasma frequency, you find that while this is uh, actually consistent with uh, uh, really this filtering being done surface plasmas uh, rather than uh, the bulk plasma. So the bulk plasmas would generally give us kind of response at a slightly higher frequency and also uh, somewhat broader, uh, higher than the uh, bulk uh, plasma frequency. And another, uh, uh, and then you can ask, okay, is it natural that it's uh, really surface plasma? And the answer is yes, because we, when we're say, sending light, uh, at high frequency, it actually it incites high energy quasi particles. Actually, this light uh, gets absorbed uh, over a very uh, small uh, length, right? There is actually very small penetration depth uh, of this optical pulse. And therefore, the shift currents which are generated, they're really generated just on the surface of a superconductor, not really in the bulk. And that's why what is being excited is really uh, surface uh, plasmas. And uh, okay. Uh, and then uh, I told you uh, uh, this. Uh, okay, now we also have this fact that right. We saw that commensurate stripes uh, do not. Uh, we did not see 
uh, the steroid heart radiation for commensurate strike, we saw them for incommensurate, you can check what are the uh, symmetry considerations for actually uh, obtaining uh, uh, shift currents. And you find that our canonical, you know, like stripes that were used to the theory in one four, they have too many symmetries. Like basically this like second harmonic or shift current, they would be forbidden uh, by kind of plain vanilla uh, commensurate stripes. There are ways around it. For example, if we introduced higher harmonics in, uh, uh, into the stripe order, if we introduce this sort of like pair density wave. So pair density wave, like gives the super connecting parameter deep change sign then actually shift currents would be excited. So actually the fact that we do not see this. Uh, uh, um, yes. I think there's work by uh, Alpha and Naga also considering high intensity light where he showed even uh, in a system with inversion symmetry, there was a shift current response. Uh, I think it was published some of them. I think it was due to just an asymmetry between leads actually connected to each other. Well, in this case, there are no leads, right? It's just surface of the sample. You're just sending something sure, into the I'm surface. Just, I'm just telling you that there was some work by Nagarosa considering high intensity light, um, where even in a centrosymmetric uh, sample, there was a shift current response. I think that's sure, sure. well, at the end of the sure. As a, you know, actually, this subject has a long history. Like, if you open a textbook, uh, they will tell you that on the surface of materials, which have inversion symmetry, you can get second harmonic generation. And then you really have to look at the numbers, how strong this effect would be. So I, I am aware of the fact uh, that you should be careful that surface itself uh, often breaks the symmetry. So, but there are many symmetries in this case. Uh, okay, I don't know this specific work of Nagaos, but as I said, I'm not surprised because yeah. people talked about it in other contexts. With other questions? Oh. Anyway, okay, so uh, as I, uh, so at least uh, I think there is an interesting uh, uh, lesson uh, that seems to come out here uh, that uh, certain types of stripe order would be inconsistent with uh, this uh, uh, kind of uh, with sort of pump uh, singing uh, stripes uh, experiment. Let's, as I said, like superconducting order parameters that change a sign across the stripes. Uh, uh, in principle, would allow shift currents, uh, and uh, therefore I would expect a different uh, response. And uh, person, if we have incommensurate stripes, they are much harder to analyze. Right, large units also, uh, but at least clearly uh, uh, symmetries. We do not have all of this inversion uh, and uh, sort of screw axis symmetries. That's why it's natural to expect that uh, they will get uh, we will get uh, shift currents. Okay, with this, let me. Uh, Conclude. I uh, sort of. I think the main message, which I hope you will take uh, from this talk, is uh, that interpretation uh, of pump and probe experiments as uh, systems being always in quasi equilibrium that we sort of transient state be thought of uh, as uh, light stabilized quasi equilibrium states is not sufficient to explain the data. Uh, on the other hand, I think that there is a kind of universal theme in uh, many of uh, uh, of the experiments. At across like, like all, many systems, superconductors, insulators, that uh, we should take seriously the idea of non-equilibrium state, uh, the idea that we have an excited uh, collective mode in the system, and this can dramatically change optical properties for reflectivity, or sometimes we can even directly see light being emitted due to this excited collective modes. Thank you. Interesting question. Yeah, I think the symmetry that uh, this kind of screw was sort of translation by two lattice constant in the C axis and then translation like by two this way. Uh, 
so clearly if it just goes plus minus plus minus right so if you translate uh sort of and it also changes sign so like it changes sign once you translate both you change inside again so it goes into itself if it's complex uh you'd have to think about it does it go back into itself or not so more or less you just you really have to check like the symmetry that uh uh uh, that like sort of we saw uh, that forbid simple stripes is uh, really kind of like down and this and we'll just have to check like whatever uh, character of the stripe face you give me like does it have the symmetry or not if it has then yes uh, we would not uh, we do not uh, expect uh, shit currents <laughs> So, is there a is there a formalism that allows you to make make you to the initial contact that serves as example factor index having one multiple yeah. sure. sure. Right. So, like in the case of uh, uh, this, like K three hundred and sixty, I gave you like a fully microscopic uh, model, right? So, in that case. I did not even appeal to index of refraction, right? I just uh, said superfluid density is being modulated. Now let me solve for an equation with a specific microscopic model, uh, uh, which but even there there was a whole discussion about why you took one single frequency and uh, uh, sure. like that. others. Uh, I mean, is there? There's an artistry to it at the moment, and I'm wondering whether there is a formalism that one that can be used to formalize the artist. Um, in, in equilibrium physics, we don't need to be artists, we just turn the crank of Max Barra methodology, right? Um, are we getting? I think we're moving in that direction because what we really need is to understand. Let's, okay, let's take a step back, right? When we talk about index of refraction, like in reality, we know what goes into calculating this index of refraction, right? In linear response theory. In linear response theory, right? But we know which collective excitation, say these are plasmons in the case of superconductors, or these are infrared active phonons, right? And so, uh, and there is a like a microscopic model that you can write, which combines max solving Maxwell equations with equations of motion for phonons. Right? And so you can, uh, Essentially, what you can do is just like uh, in the case where I didn't talk about, say, you also have a theory like for silicon carbide. So, what you can start with a microscopic model and say, oh, like for this specific insulator, I know this phonon and linearities. And now I can, again, not do all this phenomenological model with index of refraction. I can really uh, analyze a problem with phonon and linearities and say, have a pump pulse. It excites this phonon polariton. And now that phonon polariton due to phonon and linearities gives me exactly that modulation. But in that process, are you you're treating the collective mode sort of a nonlinear classical way of treating, right? Uh, in, if it's uh, like if we take an insulator, uh, like for silicon carbide, uh, that's a reasonable assumption because but that I, seems I, to I, dominate uh, all of the epsilon of omega, all the index of refraction physics. Right, but, but that, that seems to be a very important step in the whole approach to the moment, taking one collective degree of freedom and treating it as to add the quantum fluctuation to that we call it quite a lot of work. So is that, is that a key underpinning idea that you're going through is very important? OK, so there is, like in terms of quantum fluctuation, there is a separate storyline, which I'll be happy to discuss. actually relates to what you have done when you guys were looking at paraelectric to ferroelectric transition, right? So uh, something that I don't know if you followed, but there is a lot of uh, interest. I've got it to also work on this very topic. Right, that if you put in, like if you now change quantum fluctuations of electromagnetic vacuum by putting cavities, how does this affect paraelectric to ferroelectric? so uh but to me so far this was a separate story because like what we're describing here happens at very high light intensities 
right? That's why I, I can, I don't have to do quantum optics of light. I mean, there is, there are probably some interesting aspects. Like if you think about this light uh, amplification, you can see that this addition, this light amplification comes in the form of entangled photons, like because we generate one extra photon at the incoming frequency, like the signal, and one at the complementary idler. So it would be nice if we could actually see that there is some kind of drug correlations. But uh, experiments are, uh, maybe I mean, it's a long winded answer, uh, but uh, see one of my uh, hopes for experiments is uh, that they will start doing experiments in a frequency resolved manner. Right? So, because the first thing you would like to check about this theory, right? You could say what should really happen uh, in the most obvious way, like when you send a pump probe, then uh, you should measure that what gets reflected is not only signal at the same frequency, but also signal at the, this complementary idler frequency, right? Before you do anything else, just see that indeed that there is parametric uh, 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 kind of process is taking place. Unfortunately, as we said, it's terahertz technology, it's developing so all, uh, all experiments are done in this very broad band geometry. They're sending pulses, which are extremely broad band so that you cannot even separate signal from idler. That's why sometimes get, like stuff gets reflected. And uh, like even a lot, like all the previous analysis was done assuming that like what comes out uh, is sort of proportional to what came in at the same frequency, which of course for this parametric systems is completely wrong, right? You can send in light at one frequency, it comes out at, at another frequency. So I think uh, we can start thinking about quantum optics when experiments are there, when they start measuring, let's say, the signal idler nature of outgoing light. Maybe they will start measuring correlations, even like, you know, because that these photons are generated in pairs, we will have to take quantum aspects uh, more seriously. Not that there are lots of people at least working on like the two photon vectors where they try to see two photons coming out to see if there's an entanglement between the, um, you know, like the single SQs they are talking about. Oh, Isn't that again, like we should. So uh, it's a big technology in microwave frequency oh, okay, okay. So, you know, people like Michelle Devaret, they make devices, they're amplifiers, yes. but that's microwave. This is a lower frequency. Uh, that's why we talk about terahertz gap. A wonderful technology in microwave. We have great technology at higher frequencies in infrared. Terahertz is where it's hard. Yeah, talking about classical, I mean, even the collective model, if you look at the temperature dependence, you may be able to tell the lifetime of those uh, excited ones who are thinking. The temperature dependence will tell us that at least the boson of our contrast has something that tells you it's getting hot. Um, uh, it's sort of related to what we discussed before. Our models at this point, I can say the only sort of same quantitative, in fact, so semi that uh, like, like a lot of, let's say, decay may uh, come not just because of finite lifetime, but because it's, it's kind of modulation is multi-tonal. It has many frequencies in it. That's why I would not, you know, take very seriously. Uh, I will, at least I will not try. Okay, if somebody does it, I'll think about. At least I will not try very seriously to, let's say, use these experiments to extract really the lifetime of whatever we excited. That it's a very complicated process, and we had, uh, I hope we get a qualitative picture like of it. But I'm sure we're not getting all the details correctly. And I think we first we have to get all the details correctly. But there are other things which I sort of swept under the rug. Uh, like, say, when I talked about a lot of this flake, I assumed that the entire system uh, was modulated, right? That my superfluid density was modulated. Well, well, that's actually not true. There is finite penetration depth for the pump pulse. So you, we also have to worry about uh, some spatial homogeneity. So, okay, it's, it's not a problem. I think about it more like an opportunity. It's a new field. There's a lot of cool things we can do. Uh, Okay, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah. I just ask a general question. So, um, in the context of these uh, on the critical heavy terminals, your colleague uh, Lanza Friedman recently <laughs> come forward. Um, the idea is that you drive it, and uh, 
And then sometime later, you could uh, see the echoes of something that uh, was uh, created by initial perturbation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so just as a part, maybe just a general discussion, do uh, you have some perspectives about using this kind of protocols uh, to probe uh, some probe metal or some unusual exhibit? Station type of the, uh, the nature of that station is <clears throat> maybe a long time is hard, but I you know, just wonder whether there's some prospect of thinking about it. Okay, so yeah, I don't, I'm not aware of this expand, but I thought like a lot of what I presented to you today has the spirit, right? Like say LBCO, the dry with optical light, sometime later, the airport slide comes out, right? And so okay, this tells you about like, plasmas. Maybe. Uh, Maybe I have also in mind some of these gapless uh, topological systems like wires and metals, uh, these kind of uh, nonlinear responses that we use uh, to probe uh, chirality and other aspects. So, so I wonder whether there's either some particular correlation function, uh, say the equivalent of the uh, nonlinear optical uh, response that in some cases can be connected. Some particular microscopic quantities or, or, or some other forms. I mean, I think uh, the closest to what you're asking is multidimensional spectroscopy. You know, usually that's, but again, it's not something you pump and something comes out. Is uh, well, it, it is kind of like that. So, uh, because in a sense, what is like our usual optical kind of reflectivity, you can say, oh, you drive, right? You send in light and then material radiates back at you. So, and uh, like the way it's done, let's say in the context of infrared spectroscopy, right? You send the infrared light, which excites some kind of molecular excitation. And then you measure uh, kind of infrared light that comes out of the sample at a later time. So that's, that's, and then you can sort of do Fourier transform with respect to the time between like, say you drive and you measure. That, that would be analogous to sigma of omega, but then what these guys have been doing, you can say drive at the first time, then you can drive at the second time. And then like you measure life that comes out at the third time. That's now two, well, now you have two times. That's how it becomes two dimensional spectroscopy. So essentially, and then of course you can do it even more dimensional. More, more dimensional. Uh, so uh, uh, I think the Johns Hopkins uh, group by Peter Armitage, so they are already doing this with superconductors, right? With some of the glassy system, they are exploring uh, this multidimensional uh, spectroscopy. So I don't think we, uh, we have, we, okay. Uh, there are some, like in some, cases you can develop some general understanding of this multidimensional spectroscopy like uh, say uh, again there have been a few theories right working uh, uh, with Peter uh, but uh, it's not as developed uh, so I don't think you can just uniquely tell I think it's still like the way more or less I was thinking uh, this theory sort of is very much at the level of uh, like of uh, this infrared spectroscopy of molecules, so you see it's just one mode, right? And some which which may have some linearity, which may have some kind of disorder broadening, uh, which may have some finite lifetime. But uh, I don't think, at least I'm not aware of the formalism. Maybe okay, if people know, I would be happy if they tell me. If let's say it's some interacting few few theory, I don't even simple models like Saint Gordon for Jellison plasma, how to correctly construct say understand uh, like responses in such multi-dimensional protocols uh, if we have a truly interacting uh, uh, many body system i don't know if it answers the question yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool.